The backlash against Theresa May's plans for new grammar schools is growing. Now the last Tory education secretary says they could undermine six years of reform. But the PM is not backing down. In her first major policy speech, she said her priority would be those who were only just managing in life. I want to see children from ordinary working class families given the chances their richer contemporaries take for granted. That need means we need more great schools. Also on News at 10 tonight. What is going on in Iran? It's supposed to be opening up, but today it jailed a British mother for five years on unknown charges. North Korea announces it's tested another atomic bomb and insists it is close to building a nuclear missile. Derby Day, how did they get from this to this? What the two biggest managers in British football had to say today on their rivalry and the big match tomorrow. How do you do? And back to Beatlemania, how George Martin's son helped the Fab Four clean up the soundtrack to the 60s. This is ITV News at 10 with Tom Bradby. Good evening. She is certainly not starting quietly. You might even say that so far her plans and her language sound avowedly Thatcherite. The changes Theresa May is proposing in education are certainly as radical as anything since the introduction of the comprehensive system itself. In announcing detailed plans for the expansion of existing grammars today and the creation of new ones, Mrs May promised to make the UK the great meritocracy of the world, a country where people could rise according to their talents regardless of their background. It signalled a total break with the public school ethos of her predecessor. But if the critical storm that followed today's speech is anything to go by, it is clear Mrs May has also put her own political neck firmly on the line. You won't find grammar schools in York, at least not now, but Theresa May's government could turn this comprehensive, in fact, any comprehensive, into a school which selects on ability if her plans survive as they were set out today. <laughs> Theresa May's first big speech was a pitch to working class voters, those families who don't claim benefits but still struggle to make ends meet and find a good school for their children. I want to see children from ordinary working class families given the chances their richer contemporaries take for granted. That ne means we need more great schools. And for more great schools, she confirmed she meant selective ones. For we know that grammar schools are hugely popular with parents. We know they are good for the pupils that attend them. And we know that they want to expand. So how will expanding grammar schools in the Theresa May way improve rather than hinder social mobility? She wants selective schools to take a quota of pupils from low-income households and work with local primary schools in disadvantaged areas. The entrance test, the old 11 plus, will assess the true potential of children, not just those who have been tutored. And further tests are planned after age 11 at 14 and 16. No matter what quotas you put in, no matter how many feeder schools you tell grammar schools to help, you'll still end up with good schools who cream off the brightest pupils and less good schools. I have to say uh, that one of the mistakes I think you're making is an assumption that even in that sort of binary system, you had good schools that took us pupils of a certain ability and by definition other schools weren't good. What we want to do is ensure that all schools in the country are providing a good quality of education for children. I want to but the plans have already run into some heavyweight opposition. The former Tory Education Secretary Nicky Morgan tweeted today, identifying areas of poor education and lack of good schools is right. Idea that more selection is the answer is wrong and the plans have another powerful enemy. The great danger of selection at, at 11 is that we are consigning children to failure. They feel they fail their test and then they're off to a, a secondary, what used to be known as a secondary modern school because they're not all ability schools, they're not taking in the brightest and the best, they're taking those who have failed at 11. 
The big question for the Prime Minister is whether pupils in non-selective schools do better and reach higher because they learn alongside the most able. At Huntingdon Comprehensive in York, some sixth formers say mixed ability works best. If you have people who are like sitting right next to you aiming for a stars, you're like, well, I can as well. And then if you think that, you're more likely to get there. Big independent schools did not escape Theresa May's line of sight today. They were warned their tax breaks could be removed unless they shared more facilities and teachers with state schools. I think there's been definitions over the last 20 years trying to ensure that schools that receive charitable status actually earn it. It's proved very difficult to do that. Theresa May has done her homework, but the House of Lords will ultimately mark it and they're not currently minded to give her a pass. And Chris uh, is here. Chris, to be fair, I mean, every policy that's ever been announced by any government in history gets a backlash. So just assess for us how serious you think this well, is. I mean, I think it's partly a product of the fact that we've been uh, talking about this for the past three or four nights in a way, haven't we? And that's allowed a lot of people to build up their opposition to this and with apologies to viewers in Scotland, Northern Ireland and Wales who aren't affected by England's grammar schools. Uh, but there is a lot of opposition, I think, and significant opposition. Look at Nicky Morgan, the former Education Secretary. Look at Sir Michael Wilshaw, the outgoing head of uh, Ofsted, the school's uh, inspector. Now, I had this conversation with Downing Street tonight and I said to them, a lot of people are against this thing. Mm. They said, yeah, but they're thinking about the academy system as it was back in the 1950s, not the, sorry, the grammar system as it was in the 1950s, not the grammar schools that Theresa May is proposing, which will operate in a completely different way, where you've got good schools surrounded by other good schools, not like how it used to be with the grammars doing well and the secondary moderns not doing so well. So, but they've got a lot of explaining to do, particularly in the House of Lords, who are minded, you know, to throw this whole thing out when it comes to them. OK, and I said at the top of the programme that her language feels her style, her policies even feel kind of avowedly Thatcherite. What do you make of the language of today's speech? I think the, the interesting part of this speech today was the context in which she set the whole school's policy. Now, a couple of things you would have heard Theresa May say over the summer. One's Brexit means Brexit. She said that a lot. The other thing she said a lot was my government will operate for everyone, not the privileged few. Now, today we found out who that who those people are, what's the target audience? The target audience, she said herself, are people who earn 19, 20, 21,000 pounds a year, know they're not on benefits, but they're the type of people who think government have ignored them, have, have not addressed their concerns. Mm -hmm. And I think, as you said uh, in your introduction, pe she's got a new phrase for them. They're people who are just managing or just getting by. And those are the people, perhaps a bit like Margaret Thatcher when she went for those blue collar workers, those are the people that she's going to be looking at. And all of her speeches, coming up, and there's a few more coming up on, on jobs and economy and others, they'll be targeting these people. Interesting in a way that she's so specific, actually, about who she's targeting. But, Chris, for now, thank you very much indeed. Now, you might ask, what really is going on in Iran? The country is supposed to be opening up. Indeed, it's only nine months since sanctions were lifted with great fanfare and only a day since we appointed a new ambassador to Tehran. His first task is likely to be to find out why a British-Iranian mother has been thrown into jail by the country's revolutionary court for five years. The charges for which Nazanin Zaghari Ratcliffe was condemned were, and indeed remain, a secret since the charity worker's arrest in April after visiting family members. She has never been formally told. Nazanin Zaghari Ratcliffe has been separated from her baby daughter for nearly six months. At two, Gabriella is too young to understand why she's now here living with her grandparents in Iran, her passport confiscated by Iranian authorities. Her father was hoping to have them both home by Christmas, but today, in just the third phone call from his wife since her arrest, news she'd been sentenced to five years in prison for charges that remain a secret. She said the charges were ridiculous um, and that, you know, five years, can you believe it, um, we're going to appeal. And there was a fight in her in, in that. She then um, said, you know, I, I mean, I've been separated from Gabriella for, for, for nearly six months. That's a fifth of her life. Um, do they understand what it's like for a mother to be separated from a young child for that long? And how is her health? You said she's lost a lot of weight. She's not been able to put that weight back on and, and she's lost uh, her hair. has been falling out. When she came out of solitary confinement, she, she couldn't walk without getting blackouts. Nazanin is expected to serve her sentence in Iran's biggest, most notorious jail, Evan Prison. She's currently being held in its high security wing, controlled by the Revolutionary Guard. 
Shiva Mabobi was jailed there for more than three years at the age of 16 for campaigning for women's rights. I was tortured by, you know, flagging on the sole of my feet and it was hugely, I mean, um, painful and also being humiliated, beaten up, threatened. It's thought Iran's Revolutionary Guards are claiming Nazanin was part of a plot to undermine the government. But one former Iranian diplomat claims she's being used as a political pawn. This event has to do with internal domestic policies of Iran. Dual nationals who are charged as or who are referred to as spies by these minority hardcore elements, you know, who control the security apparatus in Iran. The Foreign Office says it's deeply concerned about the reports of Nazanin's sentence, but Richard Ratcliffe wants action, not words, to release his wife and reunite his family for what he's calling a punishment without a crime. Sally Lockwood, News at 10. Well, in fact, Nazanin Zaghari Ratcliffe is not the only dual citizen facing charges in Iran. Indeed, there does seem to have been a spike in arrests this year. Some have linked the rise to the nuclear deal Iran signed with the West in January, which led, of course, to economic sanctions being lifted. In any event, since the deal, at least six dual nationals have been arrested in Iran, accused, it seems, of spying or of criticising the regime. They include Homer Hudfa, a Canadian-Iranian professor who's been held since June, and Baka Namazi, who was arrested in February. His son, Siamak, an American-Iranian businessman, is also under arrest. There are few details of the actual charges, but some activists believe Iran's conservative revolutionary guard is battling back against closer ties with the West, a reaction which, if true, seems to have made visitors with dual nationalities into potential political bargaining chips. Now, on the other side of the world, Britain's Paralympians have been enjoying another gold rush in Rio tonight. They've already got more medals in the bag, including two golds in the velodrome and, with a new world record, Georgie Hermitage, one of two golds on the athletics track. Dame Sarah Storey, who won her gold last night, spoke to us today about what it means to become Britain's most successful ever woman Paralympian. Up towards the line, surely he's got it, yes he has. Another evening of golden results, none more deserving perhaps than cyclist Jody Cundy. The amputee felt he was robbed in London after a starting gate failed, but the officials had said it was his fault. So four years of simmering resentment distilled into a vintage performance in the time trial. And then two further golds in six breathless minutes in the athletics. Georgina Hermitage in the T37 100 metres in a world's best, followed by Sophie Hahn in the T38. Both have neurological conditions, both proved unbeatable. But it's about Sophie Hahn. Last night it was all about the dozen for the Dame, a 12th Paralympic gold for Sarah Storey. A piece of history that she told me she can't get her head around yet. The enormity of being the most successful probably won't sink in until we're back at home and we're scrubbing the bathroom floor or something and you realise, oh, yeah, that's, that's pretty cool. If Story has heard the national anthem countless times, it was the first occasion her three-year-old daughter Louisa had and the youngster apparently had a somewhat different interpretation. She loved it. As soon as the national anthem started going, she started singing Let It Go from Frozen, so she was, uh, she, she was having a whale of a time. It didn't really matter what sort of song we were singing, she was really, really happy. Trying to make a chance. But as for emotional days, try beating that of Libby Cleggs. She broke the 100 metres world record in the heats, then was disqualified after her guide runner was adjudged to have illegally gone ahead of her. That decision was then overturned, and she is now favourite for the final in less than an hour. So, after its golden start to the Rio Paralympics, the UK team is a strong second in the medal table tonight. China is at the top with 26 medals. The UK has 20, nine of them gold. Uzbekistan sits in third place. Uh, Richard Palo joins us now from Rio. R Richard, what's still to come tonight?
Well, yes, on this exhilarating evening, I think there will be more. Uh, in the Athletic Stadium, yet more gold, I suspect. You saw Libby Clegg earlier, but I think the real story may become a Johnny Peacock. You'll remember him from London, the lower leg amputee who lit up the T44 100 metres, as charismatic as he is quick. Well, he is competing uh, at midnight UK time. He is favourite. He set a Paralympic record uh, going into that. So that is the one to look out for. Uh, tonight. We've also picked up another couple of medals in powerlifting and the swimming finals are going on tonight and we have plenty of chances in there. Now to put it into context, today is a very busy day medal-wise. Medal -wise. There were 50 gold medals on offer, so T uh, Paralympics GB have done very well, but and privately officials here I think are pretty chuffed with how things are going. Okay Richard, for now from Rio, thank you very much indeed. Sometimes the way very serious developments are announced in North Korea can come across as just a tiny bit comical. Perhaps it's the excited newsreader or the grinning face of the great leader. In any event, there is nothing remotely funny about almost everything that happens in this confusing, frankly dangerous country. The latest news concerned another underground atomic bomb test, the second this year, which caused a pretty significant earthquake. More troubling still, the fact that Pyongyang claims it is now close to building a nuclear missile. It was with great excitement that North Korea declared its latest nuclear test a success. This special state broadcast celebrating leader Kim Jong-un and his newly manufactured weapon of mass destruction. There was swift and emphatic international condemnation. I condemn in the strongest possible terms the underground nuclear test by the Democratic People's Republic of Korea. This is yet another brazen breach of the resolutions of the Security Council. Japan and South Korea particularly uh, are deeply concerned because of the neighborhood, but I think it's fair to say that China, Russia, the United States, everybody shares concerns. That this cannot go on, this is unacceptable, and that these, uh, these detonations must cease. In recent months, North Korea has conducted a series of ballistic missile launches, apparently a prelude to today's nuclear test. This was the fifth test in 10 years, and by far the most powerful, triggering a 5.2 magnitude earthquake. That indicates an explosive yield of 10 kilotons, just five less than the Hiroshima atomic bomb. Now the country claims to be capable of mounting nuclear warheads on ballistic rockets. Kim Jong-un has been described as a man on a path of self-destruction and a threat to world peace. Five rounds of UN sanctions have failed to halt North Korea's nuclear advancement. Even repeated pleas from closest ally China to disarm have been ignored. It's hard to see what would work in the face of such determined military proliferation. Nuclear tests are given a sense of occasion in Pyongyang. This latest show of strength, a cause for celebration. It may be almost entirely cut off from the rest of the world, but this most reclusive and extreme of nations is gravely close to fulfilling its nuclear ambition. Debbie Edward, News at 10. Not the news we all wanted to hear. Now back here, there are some controversial issues in medicine that never seem to quite go away. And the use of statins to treat high cholesterol is certainly one. Fears about possible side effects have previously prompted, prompted thousands of heart patients to stop using what many doctors say is a potentially life-saving drug. But today, a huge new medical review pronounced statins totally safe to use. The latest stage in a seesaw debate, perhaps. But will this be the last of the headlines about statins? Now, everyone aged over 50 should be given statins because even in healthy people, they reduce the risk of heart attacks. Let's quickly return now to that story about statins and the latest advice that you shouldn't take them. Here, doctors say thousands of people are at risk from heart attacks or stroke because of confusing advice over statins. More than 200... Despite the confusion, Steve Bowley has continued to take his daily statin. His father had two heart attacks and he was deemed at high risk. 
I think I would have led a life um, worrying what was around the corner. Whereas now, I still know that at some point I'm going to die, but it's going to be <laughs> hopefully in my 90s or my 100s rather than in my 50s. The latest review found that if 10,000 high-risk patients took statins, 1,000 strokes or heart attacks could be prevented. And for the same number of low-risk patients, another 500 would be prevented. Across the whole country, up to 80,000 potentially fatal attacks may have been avoided each year. Figures supposed to end uncertainty after contradictory reports on harmful side effects led to many at highest risk stopping taking statins. Professor Rory Collins, who compiled today's findings, is angry patients have been misled. Misinformation um, doesn't help uh, the public, doesn't help patients, and of course it doesn't help the, the doctors on the front lines, the GPs, so you know, they're the ones who have to bear the brunt. But Dr Fiona Godley is one of a group of doctors who disputes these findings. She edits a rival medical journal, which it's alleged has published misleading information. We're talking about a public health intervention now. It's no longer a medical conversation. It's about uh, healthy people taking a, taking a tablet every day. You have, in effect, been accused of scaremongering, of persuading people not to take this when it could be saving their lives. How do you respond to that? It is a serious charge. It's one I take very seriously. I don't think it's true. I think the trialists involved in this review article would like the debate to stop. The fear is that while the medical profession is split, People in the same boat as Steve with a family history of heart attacks or high cholesterol may not be persuaded to continue taking their statins. Keep it going. Juliet Bremner, News at 10. Now, scientists hunting for clues to the origins of life are taking their search to a clump of ice and rock shooting through space hundreds of thousands of miles away, as you do. NASA launched a rocket today that it hopes will reach an asteroid called Bennu in about two years. Once there, the idea is to gather and analyse rocks and chemical co compounds that are as old as the solar system itself. Three, two, one. And liftoff of OSIRIS-REx, its seven-year mission to boldly go to the asteroid Bennu and back. Heading for an asteroid in the hope of discovering the key to life here on Earth, NASA's OSIRIS-REx mission has taken a decade of planning to get to the start of this seven-year mission, aiming for an asteroid called Bennu. OSIRIS-REx has gone supersonic. OSIRIS-REx will spend the next two years travelling through space toward the asteroid. Once it arrives, it will spend two years mapping and studying Bennu. Then its robotic arm will reach out and grab material from the surface. It has three chances to successfully gather samples. Once a sample is captured, the spacecraft will start making its way home and arrive back on Earth in 2023. What will happen when the samples come back will be decades of study. And that's what's really exciting about it. The ability to hang on to those pristine materials, pose questions and go to them and have them answer them for us. Astronomers at the Royal Observatory in Greenwich say it's one of the most important space missions to date. These rocks, they lie between the two planets, Mars and Jupiter, um, and they hold, hopefully, the clues, the key to uh, the origins of our solar system. Um, so maybe this uh, asteroid will tell us a little bit more information about um, how the origins of life came about on Earth. So this is an incredibly exciting um, mission. OSIRIS-REx hopes to bring back about 60 grams of asteroid material, about the size of a chocolate bar. Its contents could provide science with the answers to life's most basic questions. Everything continuing on the timeline. Neil Connery, News at 10. And before we leave you thinking it's all good news from asteroid Bennu, there is a dark side, as well as possibly containing the secrets of life, the universe and everything, it's also on NASA's list of potentially hazardous asteroids, which is a way of saying in around 150 years' time it might crash into Earth. Where's Bruce Willis when you need him, one might say. 
Now, it is one of the biggest rivalries in sport, and tomorrow it takes centre stage here in one of the oldest duels in British football. For years, Jose Mourinho and Pep Guardiola have contended for the bragging rights to be Europe's top football manager. Now, they're about to face each other for the first time as bosses of Manchester United and Manchester City, respectively. They're two of the greatest ever managers who've had some of football's greatest ever clashes. It got so bad when in charge of Barcelona and Real Madrid, they often wouldn't even look at each other. And when they did, it turned into a shouting match. And tomorrow they'll meet again. So at today's press conferences, it seemed an obvious subject to ask about. Pep, there are many pictures of you and Jose shaking hands at matches, but not looking at each other. How will your meeting be tomorrow? And how would you describe your relationship with him? Okay, the last period in Madrid, Barcelona was not easy for both of us. Uh, but uh, we met each other two weeks ago, three weeks ago in the manager's Premier League and we spoke fluently. And if Guardiola was trying to play it down, Mourinho was, well, cryptic when asked about their relationship. You know, for me, you are one of the best journalists that I found in, in this country. So you don't need my answer to, to have an answer. But it wasn't always like this. At Barcelona in the 1990s, the pair were friends here celebrating winning the Cup Winners' Cup together. Guardiola was a player back then. Mourinho worked as a coach and translator. But a decade later, Guardiola was made Barcelona manager when Mourinho wanted the job. Instead, Mourinho went to Inter Milan, who then beat Barcelona in a controversial Champions League semi-final. And when he then moved to Barca's bitter rivals, Real Madrid, the feud intensified as they went head-to-head -head in Spain. But it's Guardiola who holds the edge overall, with seven wins to Mourinho's three. At the moment, they seem to both try to avoid the confrontation. But it won't last. I don't think so. It really is going to be quite fascinating to see how these two men react when they see each other again here at Old Trafford tomorrow. And one of the reasons why they clash so badly is because in many ways, they're quite similar. They're both ruthless. Guardiola dropped England keeper Joe Hart, Mourinho sidelined German World Cup winner Bastian Schweinsteiger. But above all, they're both winners and probably the two best managers in the world. Ian Payne, News at 10, Manchester. We'll see. And finally, a new film coming out next week promises to reveal the Beatles, not just as you've never seen them before, but indeed as you've never heard them. The hordes of screaming fans that greeted the Fab Four everywhere they went were a totally new phenomenon in the early 60s. And while all that certainly added to the excitement of their newfound fame, it wasn't maybe the best way of actually listening to their music. How do you do? Why do they scream? I don't know. No, I couldn't tell you. The screams were the soundtrack to Beatlemania, but for the Fab Four on stage, well, they were fighting a losing battle. This, in the new documentary, is Ringo's assessment of playing the Shea Stadium in New York. I could not hear anything. I'd be watching John's ass, Paul's ass, his foot tapping, his head's nodding, to see where we were in the song. The complete hysteria. If you imagine yourself being on a phone call in a loud room, it's about 400 times worse than that. So that's what we have to deal with. We've got to work out a way of de-screaming stuff. Who better to undertake the task than Giles Martin, the son of the Beatles producer Sir George Martin. Giles had worked with his late father on a number of Beatles projects. Now he found himself using modern technology to improve the recordings his father had had to contend with. Long tall Sally. I'm not a the girls are overwhelming, Paul. And it's very hot for years. So what we can now do is... I mean, you can hear Paul much more, you can hear the drums much more. It's much more powerful. You can hear Ringo. You can hear Ringo. Yeah, switch back. George Martin died six months ago and remixing his live album of the Beatles at the Hollywood Bowl alongside... After my dad passed away, um, I came back to work and I, a, a people from the record label came to see me. The first thing I played was my, I heard my father's voice on the tapes. And just the fact that 
that he trusted me with this and they trust me with this is just a huge honour. Even modern technology can't silence all the screams, but then incredible scenes like these are all part of the Beatles' story. Nina Nana, is it Tim? Looks amazing. That's it for now. I'll be back on Monday. I uh, hope you have a brilliant weekend, but for now, good night and thank you very much for watching.